Hello, hello, and welcome to another coordinating call of the M25, the Movement for Europe, featuring progressive ideas you won't hear anywhere else. I'm Meron Khalili, and we've got a few topics for you today. First, we'll talk about the crisis at the EU-Belarus border, where tens of thousands of families are stranded in desperate conditions. To what extent are they being weaponized by political forces in Belarus? and political forces in the EU. Then we'll talk about Germany, where we've just founded a new political party. What are the next steps there for us uh, as DiEM25? And as the new coalition government takes shape, what are we going to do about providing a progressive alternative for German voters? We'll talk about how to make next Black Friday or Black Friday, uh, make Amazon Pay Day with our sister organization, the Progressive International. But first, um, there's someone who unfortunately is missing here today, and that's our colleague, Rosemary Beckler, who passed away last weekend. So first, we'll be remembering her. Yanis, please get us started. Thank you, Maran. Rosemary is one of those exemplary comrades, human beings, scholars, activists, that um, um, we simply could not afford to do without, not just the M25, the planet, humanity. I got to know her because she joined DM 25 on day one of the M25 when we converged in Berlin, she was there. She had no reason to be there except that as a true internationalist, left-wing socialist internationalist, she saw in DM 25 an opportunity to uh, work across borders. Uh, that was the one thing that really motivated uh, Rosemary's life, to break down borders, whether these are borders between communities, uh, trades unions and political parties, uh, different um, groups and group of schools within the left, the Greens, uh, different uh, regions and countries, she had this penchant for demolishing the walls that separate. She had this true belief, genuine belief, in uh, the capacity of progressive causes to bind together people and, uh, and communities. And ever since she joined the M25, she's been the best example one can think of of somebody who is hugely supportive of everyone, each and every one of us, while at the same time being hugely critical. Uh, because, you know, today, with this all this uh, nonsense that um, has uh, infected even the left about the importance of safe spaces and everybody being kind to everyone, yeah, she is a paragon of what we really needed, which is, yes, you need to support everyone. Everybody must feel be that, that they belong, while at the same time, you know, being ruthlessly critical of everyone, <laughs> including herself. Um, she, you can, you can go into a website and you can see that uh, Johannes and others, uh, and David, have put together a beautiful tribute to Rosemary Batchelor. Uh, I shall simply end this soliloquy of mine. I could, I could talk for, for hours by saying that um, none of us knew she was sick because she thought it was just a nuisance, that she was very ill. And she also believed that as long as she had the breath in, inside of her, um, she was immortal. And the way she put it to us was that, you know, because, you know, she was actually sending us messages. Um, with guidelines on what we should do for our national health service campaign in Britain, our party in Germany, our party in Greece, even while she was dying from a hospital bed. And most of us didn't even know she was sending us those messages from her hospital bed. We just, I knew, uh, but I was even trying to, it was very difficult to, to imagine that she, she was so ill because it, her messages were long, and juicy. Uh, and then at some point they stopped. And that was the end. Um, soon after that, we found out from Nick, her wonderful husband, um, great comrade, that uh, she had passed. Uh, it's um, devastating for all of us. 
But at the same time, we have a duty to celebrate her life and uh, to draw strength from that. She would not want us to lament. She would not want us to mourn. She would simply want to do that, what she said in my last, in her last email to me. And I'm sure in other emails, she had equally significant things to say, poignant things to say to others. She said, um, uh, go to sleep now, she said. You, you've been very tired with this, all this campaigning that you do. Um, I will go to sleep as well. But going to sleep simply meant uh, recovering strength to continue the struggle. So here's to you, Rosemary. Thank you, Yanis. And uh, we'll miss you, Rosemary. <sighs> um, OK, we're going to talk now about the crisis at the EU-Belarus border. And, and um, if I can perhaps bat the ball back to you, Yanis, because I know that you have to go. And you started uh, talking about this, chat, this uh, topic last time. And it's evolved a little bit since then. So perhaps if you could uh, speak about that, and then we can open it up to everyone else on this topic. Well, the great German philosopher, not even a hugely, pro a hugely progressive one, Immanuel Kant, uh, made the point that um, the one thing we don't have the right to do is to treat human beings as means to some exogenous objective end. That we have a duty as human beings to treat human beings as ends in themselves to treat them for what they are, um, an autonomous purpose. So weaponizing and instrumentalizing people is a form of slavery. And Kant's point, and I think it was a good one, one that another German philosopher, Hegel, took further, was that if you do that, if you instrumentalize people, then without recognizing it, without even realizing it, you are instrumentalizing even yourself. Okay, from the highly abstract philosophical, let's go down to, to earth and to the tangible. In the summer of 2015, when uh, Syrian refugees and other refugees started streaming from Turkey to Greece, the island of Lesbos, famously, but other islands as well, um, Angela Merkel had an epiphany for about 10, 15 days. She was a good person. <laughs> she opened Germany's borders to these refugees. And immediately after that, the Christian Democrats within her own party threatened to topple her. So being Angela Merkel, she immediately uh, came to a very sordid deal with President Erdogan of Turkey. Effectively, what Merkel did was to go to Mr. Erdogan and bribe him with billions of euros uh, so that Erdogan would allow her and the rest of the European Union, which did as it was told by Angela Merkel, to violate international law. What Erdogan was trying to do was to increase his uh, own power vis-a-vis -vis the European Union, and he was instrumentalizing these refugees, uh, controlling the flow of refugees to the European Union, okay, in order to extract benefits, diplomatic benefits, financial benefits, and other benefits from Angela Merkel. And Angela Merkel cut a deal with him. She bribed him with billions of dollars and euros to, you know, if he regulated those flows, uh, we would then violate, we the Greeks, the Germans and so on, would violate our obligations to refugees. So it was a double weaponization or instrumentalization of hapless refugees. Erdogan was weaponizing the refugees so as to extract concessions from and money from Merkel. Merkel was weaponizing and instrumentalizing the refugees so as to signal to their friends in Syria, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Afghanistan, don't come to Europe because you will end up in Turkey or in a horrible camp, you know, on Samos. We now we have prison camps, you know, like you know, prisons, large prisons. 
Why am I mentioning this? I'm so, I was supposed to be talking about um, Belarus. Well, because if one dictator discovers that there are benefits to be had similar to the ones that another dictator has extracted from the European Union, what did Angela Merkel think? Didn't she know that Lukashenko and others would, you know, bordering the EU, would look at all the benefits that Erdogan managed to extract from her and say, I want some too. So this is exactly what he did. When uh, the European Union started imposing sanctions against um, Belarus, the regime, Belarus, the leadership of Belarus, Lukashenko said, okay, I'll do, whatever, I'll do it as Erdogan did. So he had some refugees imported from Turkey and other places to Belarus and weaponized them. And what is the European Union doing? Instrumentalizing those people. So you've got the Belarusian authorities pushing them towards Europe, the European Union, the European Union pushing them back. And now Angela Merkel and Lukashenko are engaged in exactly the same process of corrupt, uh, misanthropic relations that Angela Merkel acted to them. And they will find some formula. But what really matters is that Europe is losing its soul. It is selling its soul out in exactly the same way with Belarus as it was with Turkey. This is to the detriment of the people of Turkey, to the detriment of people of Belarus, to the detriment of the, the souls of citizens of the European Union, and of course, to the detriment is caught up in no, no man's land. This Europe is going to go down in history as the major violator of human rights. You know, Lukashenko, he's here today, gone tomorrow. The European Union is supposed to be a rules-based liberal democratic construct. This liberal democratic construct, which is only liberal and only democratic in name, is going to be the one that history will judge very, very harshly. Sianis, Maya, Maya Pelovic. Um, so yesterday uh, we had an opportunity to uh, see an episode of uh, The Voice where uh, my dear guest was Basil uh, Abu uh, Faher, uh, who is a Syrian uh, uh, cellist uh, that now lives in Brussels. Uh, and I had an opportunity to talk with him and uh, probably we will have a link uh, in uh, somewhere where you can see it and you can see the whole show. Uh, but uh, while talking to him, I had an opportunity to hear his whole story uh, because he is a, a Syrian refugee. He came uh, to Europe in 2015. Uh, he was one of the fortunate ones. Uh, he was from an upper class family, so he had money to actually come to Europe. Uh, and uh, he told us, which you can hear uh, in the show, uh, the whole situation of him coming to, to Europe and uh, of all the criminal activities that uh, happened while he was coming. And he, he needed thousands and thousands of Europe, him and his family to, to come to Europe. He was, of course, in the refugee camp uh, for fortunately only uh, some month and a half or two months uh, in very terrible conditions. But uh, he was, and he says about himself that he was one of the fortunate ones. Of course, not all of the refugees were fortunate as him to, uh, to come to Brussels. But uh, uh, the thing that he forgot to tell me during the show, which I would like to say now, because, uh, of course, we talked a, about a lot of things, so we, we couldn't, he, she just forgot to tell me, and it is an important thing, is that he still has in his ID card, uh, uh, on the, where it says nationality, it doesn't say his nationality, but it says refugee. So from 2000. 15 to now, which is like 2022 in a couple of months, he is still a refugee in Europe. And of course, the, um, all the expectations he had of the promised land Europe that he was coming to, uh, after a couple of years, uh, now he thinks of Europe differently, seeing how, he, how Europe dealt with the, the whole crisis. 
And uh, he also uh, told me that, uh, of course, at this moment, because he doesn't want to return, of course, to Syria, uh, he uh, doesn't know what the situation precisely there is because he doesn't live there anymore. Uh, but still, uh, in a way, he thinks uh, that the war in Middle East is not finished. It's just began. And he thinks the from his position of a young man that lives in Brussels from Syria, uh, that the sto whole story has just started and we will see a lot of it uh, in the near future. So I think that this is a crisis that uh, is not over. Uh, and in my opinion, and of course, in his opinion, and that uh, it's a crisis we will have to deal with in the next period. Thank you for sharing that, Maya. Ivana Nenadovic. Yes, thank you. I would uh, like to underline basically what Yanis and Maya already said. And uh, that is uh, the, the hypocrisy that I can see from the European Union once again, when it comes to this uh, um, uh, judging non-EU countries for not accepting the refugees, while the EU has uh, barbed wire fences and uh, dogs at the border of uh, Hungary or Croatia. So we must not forget that uh, refugees are coming daily uh, to the Balkans, to Serbia, Cro uh, Bosnia and Croatia, which are also passing the hot potato between the borders. And uh, while refugees are in this black hole uh, of non-EU countries uh, in the Balkans, uh, we don't even have the records what's going on. And uh, those prison camps are just torture points for them where, where they are waiting. Uh, the bureaucracy is heavy. Maybe 10 of them will pass. Maybe they won't. It's just uh, torture. And now the, the focus is only shift to Belarus and Polish border, in my opinion, uh, because there is just another dictator that uh, should be replaced. So it's convenient. But uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have anything to do with solving the crisis and um, providing people the free movement. Thanks, Ivana. Patricia Potsov. Thank you. Uh, well, on one hand, Europe seems, uh, as Ivana just said, once again to be unable to deal with this humanitarian crisis. But let me underline that it's interesting to see that a network of mayors is coming up to welcome these refugees. Let me explain you a little bit better. Uh, there is, uh, on one hand, government national country of the national countries that are completely unable uh, to find uh, any form of agreement. On the other end, mayors of the same countries is starting working together. I can make example. For example, I live part of my uh, week in Palermo. Uh, uh, the mayor of the city of Palermo is one of these men, but uh, there are also other cities like Tirana, like Potsdam in Germany, for example, and they are uh, trying uh, all together, um, at least, first of all, to welcome people uh, who need to be welcome. And after this, starting uh, any other uh, type um, of discussion. So uh, that it's interesting uh, for us as DiEM25 also um, to understand, uh, and that's what we always said, that local, um, in a way, local solution, municipality uh, is a good way, a probably uh, uh, a form of possible hope in this moment, where, of course, once again, Europe is totally unable. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you for moving us towards solutions in this um, terrible situation. David Castro. 
<laughs> Thank you, Mehran. Just to go back to what Maya was saying earlier about Basel, because I actually happened to live with him. So I've heard these stories, um, you know, over the last five years since I've known him uh, when we met here in Brussels. By the way, Basel also was the person who created the music for our DM25 documentary. If you haven't seen it, you should go and watch it on our YouTube channel. Um, but just a little comment about Basel. Um, not, you know, the idea when, when coming to Europe, you know, a lot, a lot of people obviously uh, would imagine that it would be a land of peace and a land of security and somewhere that they could look forward to living with their families and so on. Um, but what actually happened, and not just to Basel, but to, I would say, the majority of refugees and migrants that have arrived in Europe over the last 10, 20 years has been precisely the opposite. Instead of finding peace and security, they, find, they found essentially permanent insecurity where their families have been split up. Uh, they haven't been able to see each other. Um, and that's something that uh, we have to change. I mean, what kind of European Union is this? And even, you know, even he mentioned yesterday, this is, there is no European Union. This, there's a European, this union, as also we've been saying at the M25. So we have to put forward solutions um, as a movement. Uh, we have to be able to also be in power in order to implement those solutions so that we can actually act as a European Union and not this kind of divided and disunited, this, you know, union of, of states, apparently, that we have today. You know, this has to end um, so that we can actually uh, be a force for good in the world, but also within uh, our continent. Thanks. Thank you, David. Well said. Amir Kiai. Um, thank you, Mehran. And just to um, add to, you know, as we move in the conversation into what the policy positions, et cetera, should be, uh, in DiEM25, as many of the audience might have seen from our website, we have a green paper on the migration issue, of course. And not only do we include measures that are looking at the issue from a short-term point of view, in, instead of um, changing, for example, Frontex from, from a, you know, uh, the militarized border force into a search and rescue, et cetera, transition, but also looking at the underlying causes of uh, the crisis facing us. And that is primarily uh, wars and military conflict, which Europe is very much involved in, whether it's supporting um, dictators that um, uh, lead to civil wars, et cetera, across uh, the Near East and in Africa and other parts of the world, but also the fact that the weapons industry is quite active in many of these countries. That's the first issue. The second issue, of course, is climate change. And in, as, as, you, as the audience also is aware of from a Green Media for Europe point of view, we are trying to tackle that. So this is the difference that's then we were looking at the audience. And if there's any people who are willing and able to join DiEM25 to work on these policies, would be much more, would be very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. And if you'd like to work on that, dm25.org slash join is the address to stick into your browser. Let's move to our next topic. Um, the weekend before last, no, was it last weekend? I forget now, all these weekends are merging into the weeks, but um, we've recently <laughs> started a party in Germany, a political party, called Mera 25, as our Greek party is called. And next steps, what are the next steps for that party? How can people in Germany and across Europe get involved in providing a real progressive alternative for people in Germany? Let's start with Judith Meyer. Yeah, I think that um, people are already realizing how important our alternative uh, will be for Germany, because um, as you may have heard, the coalition talks uh, are in their final stages. And uh, we're seeing that uh, basically the only reason why um, a lot of people voted Greens uh, to uh, prevent climate catastrophe is not really a big topic uh, for the Greens there rather happy to give up uh, a lot of the goals, uh, such as uh, ending coal earlier um, or um, re restricting this, uh, the sale of um, combustion uh, engines uh, earlier than the EU demands it anyway. Um, also, we're seeing that um, the the list of prospective uh, ministers uh, that has been leaked um, is uh, very uh, dark. Um, we would see, for example, Lindner uh, as a finance minister. So this means more uh, austerity for, for Europe um, and um, also for Germany, of, uh, of course, uh, he would uh, have a very strong line on that. Um, then what 
that was kind of expected. I mean, between, between it was always going to be either Habeck uh, or Lindner. Habeck would have been better, I think. Um, what was less expected is that uh, the FDP, that is the, the Liberals, uh, Liberal Party, uh, they're going to claim the, the health ministry and they want to put in a guy called uh, Teurer. Um, I was not so familiar with this uh, guy before, but uh, apparently he's close uh, to the, the um, uh, Corona denying um, faction, like close to um yeah basically it's going to be a catastrophe to, to have this uh, guy in charge of the health ministry at at this uh, time even if he doesn't um uh, explicitly say that uh, there is no pandemic he's saying that we should behave as if there was no pandemic he is ag against closing anything down he's against uh, basically anything that uh, that might hurt the economy um that is looking pretty awful and um yeah the greens would have mainly robert habeck uh, in the economy and climate ministry which would be a powerful ministry but uh, who cares if they're not even going to have any um, rigid targets in the coalition treaty who cares and um yeah annalena berbuk would be foreign minister now i might have said Previously, that it's a good idea for the Greens to have uh, the foreign ministry because the Greens come from a tradition of pacifists uh, and pro uh, pro migrant uh, stances. Uh, but Baerbock in particular is not a pacifist; she's as hawkish as a Green can get. Uh, and also, um, the Greens have been hemming and hawing about uh, the refugee crisis uh, uh, on uh, Europe's borders uh, in the past few weeks. So, if they're doing that before they even uh, formally get into government i am not expecting all that much from them and i think that a lot of people are seeing this uh, already who might have put their hopes uh, in uh, the greens or in spd and they're seeing that basically this government will be not that different from the the previous ones and that is why we need this alternative for germany and we need it yesterday thank you you did you took the words right out of my mouth i was going to say <laughs> you painted the picture fortunately we have an alternative. Johannes, tell us about that. Yes, thanks. Um, we had a very exciting weekend. Actually, it was 10 days ago, 13th of November here in Berlin, um, where we presented Mera 25, who's going to be, which is going to be an alternative for uh, politics in Germany to be different from what we just heard uh, tonight. I think beginning with the migrant crisis um, and people being used and uh, from different side, as um, Janis explained, as well as the current COVID crisis really um, getting very, very bad here in Germany and the cases are rising and there's no, there's no politics that actually tackles that. Um, and of course, as well as Judith already said, now um, the climate crisis is um, lurking behind. And um, what we really need, I think, is the politics that in the current talks there the word stability is used a lot um stability for the finances stability um to not change that much but i think um what we really need uh, for all kinds of reasons that i've just mentioned um is a new vision um for actually taking responsibility um politics taking responsibility for the state um of the country um as we are in and the continent as well, of course. Um, and what we presented, um, and there will be this week, there will be a, a video released from the whole event, so you can all watch it. So watch out our uh, YouTube channels of the Mera 25, our party in Germany, but and also this one, of course, um, for this video um, to rewatch the, um, the event. And what we presented were was our program and not the 160 pages that you can read on our website, but the 11 goals that we have um, that we took out of this program and that are important for us. I'm going to mention two now, um, which are tackling um, one, some of the things that we heard about tonight. Um, the, the first one to mention is the goal to abolish Frontex, as Amir already mentioned, as DM25 has um, the goal to transform it into something that is good for humanity. Um, that's also what we are going to um, have as one of our aims of the, the electric wing, uh, the, the party here in Germany. And to abolish the, the debt break that we have 
uh, actually written in our constitution here in Germany, which is a huge problem for all good things, good things you would be able to do um, if you uh, would actually manage to um, uh, get into power um, to change um, our society and find, fight um, climate change and our the social problems that we have. This is not possible with the current stability um, policy that uh, is very prominent in, in Germany, and we're going to take this heads on. Thank you, Johannes. Um, Juliana next, but perhaps you can answer the question for me. I mean, if I'm sitting in Germany watching this, and I, I like what I've just heard from Johannes, and I want to get involved, uh, how do I do it? What do we, what does the M25 new party in Germany, Mary 25, need? And, and also, what, what's the electoral timeline that you guys are looking at? When might this party be competing in elections? Or is that not yet decided? Juliana? Uh, yes, thank you, Mehra. Um, well, to, to answer your question, I think uh, we can uh, put the link to our homepage of mehra25.de in the, in the chat. So this is where you can uh, first look at our program and there you have all the information you need about us at this moment. Um, for us, it will be, I think, and I, this is just, we haven't, uh, you know, uh, finished our strategy yet. So, but we're looking at local elections probably in the middle of next year in uh, Nordrhein-Westfalen. Um, that could be something realistic for us. Um, so this will be our first step. There are other local elections before, but they're too short not notice for us. And what we need is basically everyone. <laughs> we need everything and everyone. I mean, um, I think with uh, the election being now two months away, what you can really see in Germany, Germany feels like an abandoned ship right now. Uh, you know, the current chancellor is kind of gone and uh, the new government is yet to come. But uh, I, I saw recent polls and there hasn't been that much less trust in a government coming up after elections than in this one. Um, I mean, Scholz is also a vice uh, chancellor at this point, uh, but he hasn't, you know, been publicly seen for two months. So I think there is a lot of um, fears and a lot of um, anxiety going around to Germany about what's happening here. You know, we have the Corona crisis is at the same point as it was last year, but there's no plan. There's no, no one having any vision how to come out of this. The new government hasn't said anything. So I think it's really time for people to look for alternatives and they will look for alternatives because, um, you know, how I can feel it in my, my circle of people and friends around, they're all like, we have no idea what, what, what's coming up the next five years and nobody's very hopeful that uh, any goal will, will be reached when it comes to climate crisis or when it comes to you know, the low wages, uh, when it comes to essential workers, they're really, really you know, um, being, um, being really isolated in this crisis. They have to, to work all the time and, and to, to be there for the mistakes that politics are making. Uh, and work overtime, but they're not getting much more payment. And I think the new government will not do that. So this is what I'm saying is um, people need to organize and they need to voice what they want because it won't be served to them just uh, because it's the right thing to do. Because what we see is politics in Germany is not doing the right thing. It's just simply uh, playing political you know, chess games who will be getting which ministry and so on. So, so I think it's clear to everyone and uh, for us, it will be very exciting to start from that point because that's not, not a better point to start from. I mean, it's not nice that we have the situation, but I think it's a good point to start uh, speaking to people and giving them a perspective with our program, with our points and to see how they will react on it. And I think from the event last week or 10 days ago, we already saw that many, many people are on board with our program and that's very important. So please check it out and join. Thank you, Juliana. And for you out there who may have missed the address, that's mera25.de, M-E-R-A 25.de. If you would like a new way of doing politics in Germany, get off the spectator seats and sign up and get in touch and you can be part of making this happen. Um, 
Beral, Beral Madra on Germany. Go. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, looking to all these uh, developments from Turkey, maybe uh, we'll make the uh, environment <laughs> more uh, clear. Uh, what I'm thinking is uh, at the moment we have already 5 million refugee people living in Turkey, but today one dollar became 13 lira, which is quite high. I'm a well, uh, I'm, I have uh, really uh, no problems with my uh, living, but even people in my position are thinking about the next future in Turkey because everything is inflation is uh, 30 percent or something. So. How do you think all these 5 million people will be able to live in Turkey when 20 million people are under hung, hung, hunger uh, line and another 15 million is poverty line? So I think the governments, the new government in Germany and all the other governments will have a, a difficult uh, problem in front of them because these people will not be able to live in Turkey forever. So there will be another movement from Turkey to Europe. Because when I went to take my visa, I saw a line of 100 people. In three hours, there were 100 people and people uh, the the ofi official people there told me that every day 100, 200 people are looking for visa to Europe. So maybe people will uh, take their time and uh, go to the visa offices in Turkey and one by one they will come to Europe. So in the near future, Europe, Europe will have a more difficult problem dealing with all these foreign people, the others, you know, the others, they are the others. They are all still the others for European uh, populations. So I think this will be a problem. Thank you, Burrell. And migration will definitely be something that the German party will be aiming to tackle if, when it gets in power. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to the next topic here. Uh, this Friday is Black Friday, and as last year, we're going to attempt to make Amazon pay. We've got David Adler from our sister organization, the Progressive International, to talk about this campaign. David, the floor is yours. I pressed the wrong button. But you should be able to hear me now, and you should be able to see me now. Thanks, Mehran, for the introduction. Although selling the, selling the campaign short, I think you said we're going to attempt to make Amazon pay. No, we will together make Amazon pay. And we're very excited with the development, the evolution, the growth of this campaign from a year ago, where we had the crazy idea of building the first global coalition of workers, environmental activists, tax justice advocates to take on Amazon and its exploitative labor practices, its destructive environmental policies, and of course, its infamous tax evasion. That was a huge success. For the first time, you know, we had traction in, in multiple countries. We, had a, we built a, a parliamentary group of over 400 MPs in 36 countries, sending an open letter to Jeff Bezos to make it clear that the divide and conquer strategy that Amazon relies on to get its way in whatever jurisdiction, that this was not gonna stand. So since then, we've been working to build that coalition across Amazon's global supply chain. So that's not just the warehouse workers or delivery workers in countries like Germany and Poland and Spain and Italy, although we have deepened the relationships across the you know, Union Global Affiliates and Sigil in, in Italy and Verdi in Germany and, and many others, but also across the supply chain in Cambodia, in Bangladesh, where garment workers who are working for Amazon suppliers have faced mass firings and underpaying and wild schemes to basically uh, suppress labor organizing in Amazon suppliers. 
which we hold to be just as important uh, as actual Amazon employees. So this mobilization on Black Friday will be the largest in history. Uh, strikes and protest actions in over 20 countries. It will be a true transnational strike, which in the spirit of GM25 speaks to our vision of the world uh, and its need to transcend national boundaries in defense of things like workers' rights and put an end to corporate impunity. And we're calling on everyone to get involved. So we're very excited about the work that we're already doing with people like Lucas, with Claudia, with David on uh, you know, having the campaign take flight across the M25. But we would encourage anyone who's watching the stream to go to makeamazonpay.com to see where the actions are located, to get in touch with us. If you'd like to host an action, if you'd like to join one that's already there, uh, there should be some more information that we can pass along because we're going to need as many arms and legs and eyes and ears as possible to, to make this clear. So we're calling on people to respect the digital picket line. I think that the DM line on, on the Black Friday mobilization is that it shouldn't just be restricted to Black Friday, that Black Friday is kicking off a whole weekend of engagement with these questions of consumer um, uh, kind of gluttony <laughs> and trying to contain our, that, that, uh, those deals in order to send the right signal to our corporate overlords that we'll, we won't stand for their corrosion of our democratic institutions and their erosion of labor rights. So with all that, uh, keep your eyes out. Uh, we'll be rolling out, you know, make sure to sign up so you can stay in touch with the campaign as we, you know, announce new actions and next new mobilizations as we roll out um, actions from the streets to the parliaments around the world um, and, and get involved. Um, uh, whether that's getting in touch with uh, members of the CC who are involved with the campaign uh, or whether it's getting in touch with the PI directly, we'd love to hear from you. And there's so much work to do to either stand in solidarity or advance this campaign uh, in, in diff all the different domains uh, where Amazon is present, which as Judith will remind us is the entire internet uh, and many of the most destructive industries that we've been talking about on this call from the military industrial complex to front techs that I'm sure uses Amazon Web Services um, to uh, issues around you know, Erdogan and, uh, and the deployment of surveillance technologies. So um, it's time for us to stand up. And I think that this Black Friday mobilization will be uh, a really inspiring moment. And it's incredibly exciting for us to have DiEM uh, leading that fight across Europe. So thanks for the chance to speak about it briefly here. And like I said, makeamazonpay.com is where we'll have a lot of the information and chance to sign up to the campaign so you can stay up to date and get involved ahead of Friday. Thanks for that intro, David. Just a quick question. I mean, could you perhaps give us a, a sneak preview of what people or what we'll be asking people to do, how they can get involved um, for this campaign? Yeah, so we have uh, a, a list of strikes and actions and protests in different countries that are already planned. So one of the major things we want to do is invite people across Europe to get involved with those actions, to increase their size and representativity uh, and have DM have a real uh, presence in the, in the in the actions that are already planned, but there's also room to be hosting your own event. I mean, this thing can go from the smallest uh, social media campaign, three four people who are getting on online and, and and you know kind of writing to and tweeting about and Facebooking about the campaign, and the various people who are complicit in Amazon's various destructive practices, from the shop floor all the way to the state house. So that can be you know, the smallest action, all the way to organizing a small protest in your town square, in your piazza, where we're welcoming people to come. Uh, we have you know, all those assets, posters, banners, all the things you might need to kind of set, make the message public in the physical sense in, in your place. I understand that many parts of Europe are going through uh, another, another lockdown. So if you don't happen to be in, in Austria or any or other places affected by that lockdown, there would, you know, we, we would welcome those actions and, and could put it out into the, the map of actions that we have now up on the site. Um, so it can really, you know, um, stretch from the small to the, the more am ambitious. And we have a lot of exciting stunts that I can't announce here, but that are planned in places like the Netherlands, in places like Brazil, um, to kind of have some fun with this uh, and to try to you know, use stunts to make sure the message is getting out there. But uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that Black Friday is one of the most profitable days for the corporation Amazon. Um, and so it's so critical that we kind of reclaim the power on that day 
as citizens, as consumers, as workers, to send that message to Jeff Bezos and beyond. Thanks, David. And a comment from the chat here that make Amazon pay seems to be catching really well on catching on really well in my circles, even those who have no clue what DM and Progressive International are. So that's good. I'm very glad that it's gaining traction. And that once again, the address is makeamazonpay.com to get involved in that. And I think with that, we're getting close to the top of the hour. We're going to wrap it up. We've talked about the crisis of desperate families uh, on the, the border between EU and Belarus. We've talked about our progressive alternative that we're building in Germany, a new political party that we founded. We've talked about, of course, how to make Amazon pay. And we've collectively remembered our colleague, Rosemary Beckler, who sadly died last weekend. So thank you for paying attention, for your comments on the chat, for watching us, for your engagement. And we will see you at the same time in two weeks from now, same place for the next